Hey friends, it's Rachel. Welcome back to my channel. Today I will be reviewing Kaikeyi by Vaishnavi Patel. This is a book I read last year and quite enjoyed, and I've been wanting to do a review on it for some time, but I wasn't sure how to go about it. For me, reviewing books that I didn't like is something that I find easier than reviewing books that I did, and I think the reason for this is that while all opinions on books are subjective, it seems to me that my opinions on books that I like seem somehow more subjective than my opinions on books that I didn't like. And I think the reason for this is that when I don't like a book, there's something specific I can usually point to and say this is why I didn't like it. While when I do like books, it just strikes me as somehow more subjective to try to explain why I liked it. But we're going to give it a shot. Kaikeyi is a feminist interpretation of the Ramayana myth, and this was something that I had absolutely zero knowledge of before I read this book, but apparently the Ramayana myth is a very prominent story, legend, or myth in Hinduism, and that's what this book focuses on. In the original myth, the main character is Rama. In this book, the main character is obviously Kaikeyi. In the original myth, Kaikeyi wasn't seen as a villain exactly, but she wasn't a good person. She was painted in a bad light. And so the goal of this book was to make Kaikeyi the main character, to give her a voice, agency, and to explain why she did the things that she did in the original myth. I did see some reviews of people saying that this book is actually offensive to Indian culture and Hinduism, and I can completely see why they would think so. The book basically takes Rama, who was the hero in the original myth, and makes him something less than a hero in this book, and I can see why they'd be upset by the portrayal of this figure who is very important to their religion and culture. I was not offended by this, it's not my culture, I know next to nothing about it, and I can't really speak to that side of things, but I just wanted to make you aware that that is their opinion and these are some of the things that people are saying about it. For my part, I very much enjoyed the book. So in this book, Kaikei is actually the firstborn of her family. She has a twin brother, but she was born just a few minutes before he was, however, because he is the male, he becomes the heir, and Kaikeyi's only worth to her kingdom and her family is basically to be married off and to secure an alliance for her kingdom. Kaikeyi is not happy with this because it's not what she wants for herself. She believes that she should have more worth than that, so she prays to the gods to intervene, and also because her mother was banished by her father. And this is obviously very distressful for Kakei and her siblings because they're young and they don't understand why their father would do this. And they feel abandoned by their mother. So Kakei prays to the gods not only to help herself, but to help her mother, bring her mother back to her. But the gods never seem to listen to Kakei's prayers. So she goes off in search of some sort of answer, maybe a new god that she's never prayed before who might answer her prayers, and in her search she discovers a kind of magic that is completely hers alone, and it's the binding plane. And this manifests itself as Kaikei can see visible physical representations of the bonds she shares with others, the relationships they have, in the form of strings, and she can tug on them and manipulate them that way. These bonds are obviously invisible to everybody else. I thought this magic was really interesting, and given how Kaikei is portrayed in the original myth, I kind of thought that at the beginning, as a child, she would use the binding plane kind of from a naive standpoint, without really realizing what it is she's doing, and then as she grew older we would see the more narcissistic, manipulative side of her come out. That never happened because in this version of the story, Kaikei is not a bad person. As she grows older, Kaikei trains with her twin brother. He teaches her how to use weapons, how to drive a chariot, and this is is something that serves her very well throughout her life. I don't want to give away too much of this story, but I can't really talk about how it unfolds and why I enjoyed reading it without doing so. So we're going to transition into more spoilery territory. I'm going to explain the stories, events as they unfold. Some of these things would be more spoilers than others, but it's hard to explain what this story is ultimately about and how we get there without revealing some things that might be considered spoilers, so I just wanted to give you a fair warning. Inevitably, Kaikei does end up being married off to a neighboring, very powerful kingdom. Her kingdom will benefit from this alliance, and so she ends up being married off to a Raja named Dasharath. He has two wives previously, and none of them have given him an heir, and so obviously this is what he wants to marry Kaikei for. Kaikei's brother tries to tell her that this would be a good match, and accepting it would be the best thing for her. She could certainly do worse. Kaikei does not see this as a good match at all. It's not what she wants, and she feels betrayed by her brother for helping to broker this arrangement between these two kingdoms, and their bond is temporarily shattered completely by this. 
conflict. But Kaikeyi does end up marrying Dasharath, but before she agrees to his proposal, she makes him promise that if she bears him a son, that son will become heir, and Dasharath agrees. Kaikeyi goes to stay at his kingdom with his other two wives, Kushalya, who was the first wife, and Sumitra, who was the second. At first, Kaikeyi finds it very hard to fit in in this new world, with these other women. She's mostly grown up around her brothers, and so the relationship between these other two wives who came before her is a little bit strained at the beginning, and Kaikei is unsure of her place and where she fits into this whole thing. But what I found really reassuring and nice was the relationship that Kaikei forms with Kushalya and Sumitra. It was really wholesome and just like this sisterly bond that they share. I feel like too much of the time women in real life as well as in fiction just tear each other down all the time. They look at each other as rivals. In this case, they could have looked at each other as rivals for Dashgrath's affections, but instead they banded together, and I really liked their relationship. Throughout the course of her time in this new kingdom as Dashgrath's wife, Kaikei ends up going to war with him, and she becomes his charioteer, and she ends up saving his life, and in return he gives her, I believe they're called boons, which are basically promises. They were gifts, if I understand correctly, that were granted to him by the gods, and now he's giving them to Kaikei, so he's honor-bound to basically give her whatever she wants when she asks for them. This obviously gives Dasharath a new respect for Kaikei. Not only did she go into battle with him and performed admirably, but she also saved his life, and so not not only does he give her these boons, but he becomes to trust her more and more, he confides in her, he promotes her within his court, and he gives her the power and autonomy that she's been searching for her whole life that most women simply do not have. And this is where a little bit of the feminist messaging comes in. I don't think it's too much. I think that any messaging of any kind can easily become too much and the story can be lost in it, but I thought that it seemed very realistic given the time period. Obviously this is a fictional story, it's not real people, but throughout history most cultures and kingdoms have been patriarchal and women have had very limited rights. They were given very few options as to what they could do with their lives and who they could be, and so I thought it was realistic that Kaikei would seek out power for herself to protect herself and then want to use it to help her fellow women in the kingdom who might not be so lucky to be a Raja's wife. I really enjoyed seeing Kaikei grow into these roles and come into her own and help other women. I just thought that it was a good message. As time passes, Dasharath still has not gotten an heir, and he comes to realize that the problem may not lie with his wives, but with himself. So Agni the Fire God intervenes, and through his intervention, soon all three of Dasharath's wives end up giving birth to sons. Sumitra has twins, Kushalya gives birth to Rama, and Kaikei has a son named Bharata. According to the promise that Kaikei extracted from Dasharath, Bharata should become the heir even though Rama was born first out of all of the sons, and at first it seems like that is what's going to happen, but as time goes on, it becomes clear that Rama is more than what he seems. Kaikei vowed that all of the women would work together to raise these boys and that they would raise them to respect women and treat women correctly. However, despite her best efforts in teaching, Kaikei soon realizes that Rama has developed some pretty disturbing views about women and their place in the world. And this influence has come from a priest. And Kaikei ends up convincing Dasharath to have this priest dismissed, but he ends up inevitably finding his way into Rama's life at influencing him. It turns out that Rama is not a normal human being. He is a god in human form. He is an avatar of Vishnu who has come to the mortal world to rid it of evil. And because he is a, in fact a god, he's struggling with this. He's struggling for his divine purpose, his quest, why he is here. And so that's why he gravitates towards this priest and this man has this influence over him because he is a priest and Rama is a god. Because Rama is a god, he inevitably becomes the one that is looked to to become the heir. And Dasharath informs Kaikei that he intends to break his promise to her. Bharata will not become heir, it will be Rama. And the people want Rama to be the heir. He is the perfect candidate for it, he would be a strong leader, and so the wise thing to do in Dasharath's opinion is to abdicate the throne and Rama take his place. Kakei is obviously disappointed with this decision, but she initially goes along with Dasharath's wishes because she believes that this is in fact the right thing to do. However, Rama still has troubling opinions on women 
and this gives Kaikeyi doubt and some pause. To make matters even worse, when her twin brother, who is now ruler of their kingdom back at home, learns that Dasharath broke his promise to Kaikeyi. Her brother views it not just breaking the promise to her, but also the promise that he made to their father when Dasharath promised to marry Kaikeyi initially. And so her brother takes great offense at this and says that if she cannot convince Dasharath to take back what he's done and say, yes, Rama will not be heir, Bharata will be, then her brother will wage war on her kingdom. And Kaikeyi is understandably horrified by this because she went to war with Dasharath. She's seen battle, she knows how horrific it is, and she knows just how many people in both kingdoms that she loves will die. And so she knows that this has to absolutely be stopped. However, she cannot convince her elder brother to let it go not even trying to manipulate their relationship in the binding plane works, and so she's left to try to convince Dasharath. But he will not be moved either. He's already made the decision. It can't really be taken back now. The people are expecting Rama to take the throne. And so this is when the entire story turns, and the emotional impact really struck me. I enjoyed how this part played out. Seeing that she cannot convince her husband and wanting desperately to avoid war, Kaikeyi invokes the boons that Dasharath gave her all those years ago, and what she wants is for Bharata to take the throne and for Rama to be exiled to the forest for 10 years. She believes that not only will this avert the war, but it will give Rama time to mature and think through his views and hopefully change for the better. Obviously, this does not go down well. It completely shatters her bond with Dasharath, which is very sad because he was a good man, he treated her well, and now he hates her and sees her as nothing more than a scheming hag, basically. Like, this is what she wanted all along, power for its own sake, and she never really loved him, and it's really tragic. She is basically dismissed from all of the councils on which she sat. She grudgingly got respect from the people in those councils over the years by proving herself, and now she's just undone all of that progress in the span of one day. She is reviled throughout the kingdom and hated for what she's done. People don't know the real reason for which she did this. She's seen as just jealous. She wants her son to be heir. She hates Rama for no reason. Jealousy, her wicked servant whispering in her ear convinced her to do this. All these things that are just not true, and Kaikeyi can do nothing but bear it, knowing all the while, though what little comfort it is, that she did the right thing. So Rama is in fact banished. He takes his wife with him into the forest, as well as one of his brothers. And I believe the original Ramayana myth focuses more on those characters and what they're doing in the forest during that time. Rama has to slay this demon king who briefly appears in the book, but we don't really know a great deal about him because this story focuses on a different part of the myth, and we don't know why he's really that evil either, but we, all we really know is that Rama's wife is this demon king's daughter and he's very protective of her and believes that Rama is treating her badly. We don't really know a great deal about him. For my part, what I saw of him in the book I liked, but I assume that that's kind of what you're supposed to think. He's this evil demon king, of course he would be charming and manipulative and you wouldn't suspect him. But regardless. Sadly, Kaikeyi's relationship with Subitra is also ruined. The only one that really cares for her still is Kushalya, surprisingly enough. Her relationship with her brother eventually is repaired, but all of that goes wrong. There is still a battle, there's still loss of life, and Kaikeyi was unable to completely avoid the thing that she wanted not to happen. Her relationship with many of her advisors, her friends, are destroyed. Her relationship with her husband is destroyed. Sumitra hates her. The only person who really doesn't hate her is Kushalya, and even her own son Bharata hates her for what she's done because of the influence that Rama has over him. Eventually he does break free of this and he comes to realize how wrong he was, and they kind of reconcile, but it's just kind of sad. It's sad that things had to play out the way that they did. And the end of the book basically is that Kaikeyi is obviously not thrilled about the way things played out, but she knows she made the right decision, and she also acknowledges that one day this will be seen as Rama's story, and her part in it will not be remembered, or what will be remembered won't be remembered very fondly, but she's okay with that, because before this was Rama's story, it was her story. So overall, I just really enjoyed this book. I liked the world building. I liked how different it was from everything else that I read. I would have liked a little bit more explanation about the gods and their powers and the magic and how it works, as well as the demon-like creatures, because I simply don't know a lot about Hindu mythology or religion. I don't think it's one of the belief systems that gets a lot of attention when compared to Greek mythology. We hear a lot about Greek mythology, but not so much some of the other belief systems, and I would have liked to learn more about it, but I was interested in what I did learn from it, and I certainly 
walked away knowing much more than I did when I first opened the book because like I said I had no idea about the Ramayana myth at all. I think it's an interesting story told from another character's point of view. I can see why some people would not like it but for my part I enjoyed it and I thought the characterization was extremely well done. The emotional impact hits quite hard and who knows maybe one day I will end up adding it to my bookshelf because I think I wouldn't mind taking another journey into this world and being with its characters again. It's certainly a story that will stay with me and I do not think I will forget it anytime soon. So there you have it. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content. I appreciate each and every one of you and I will see you in the next video. Bye! Thank you.